is here wrestling observer live mike sempervivi also of wrestlingobserver.com very happy today to be joined by jeff cobb we got a lot to talk about including a new series by new japan for those of you that watched the the lions break collision series njpwworld.com every friday night starting this friday new japan strong which is going to feature a tournament the new japan cup 2020 usa jeff how you doing today I'm doing great, Brian. Thanks for having me on. So yesterday, Carl Fredericks was here on the show, and you two main evented the four-week series that just aired on NJPWWorld.com. You handed him a, a solid beating there after he disrespected you earlier in the in the tournament. And, of course, as I talked to him yesterday, you guys have known each other for a long time, like pretty much since day one. He said you had a hand in, in training him originally, so... What are your thoughts on on Carl Fredericks and that match and in that whole series? Uh, well, Carl as a sub, he's, he's a great uh, talent. I think he's definitely the future um, pro wrestling as well as New Japan. Um, but you know, I think it kind of got to his head a little bit, uh, especially um, that first week of uh, the New Japan shows where he kind of disrespected myself and and Rocky Romero and even the. Uh, tj perkins so those kind of things like i mean you know you gotta he just got out of the line uh, the young line system so he's got to kind of know his place and work his way Have, i mean maybe not me but tjp and rocky romero definitely show them some respect so you know we just have to give him some tough love i think everybody is well aware of your olympic pedigree but I guess tell everybody a little bit about the journey from the Olympics to professional wrestling. When you were growing up, what did you want to do for a career? How long were you interested in pro wrestling, and how did this all happen? Well, growing up is pretty much only pro wrestling. That's all I wanted to do. Um, yeah, I didn't want to be a firefighter or, or you know anything like that or a police officer. And I just wanted to be a wrestler. Like that's what that's what I saw as a kid. And that's what I fell in love with as a kid. And I mean, you could definitely, uh, you know, I could probably send a thank you letter to Hulk Hogan because I remember seeing him and I was, I was immediately hooked just, just off of him. And yeah, just, that's all I wanted to do was just be a pro wrestler. Were you one of those guys that started amateur wrestling because you thought that you were going to show up and there would be a ring there? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Dude, that took you to the Olympics. Yeah, but I mean, you know, like, I guess that was the only. I mean, I don't know. I was too short to play basketball, so I, I guess wrestling was the next best option. I guess it was the closest thing to to uh, professional wrestling. I guess. I mean, I, I, I just assumed there was a sign. Well, when I saw a flyer that said wrestling, and I just said, you know what, it's got to be a sign. And lo and behold, I was wrong. But I mean, it took me on a great on a great little journey. Now, when you when you showed up and there was no ring, I mean, what was the level of disappointment on a scale of 1 to 10? I mean, was it like, ha, ah, I need to get out of here, I'll give it a shot or whatever. How quickly did you fall in love with amateur wrestling after you stepped in there that first day? And did you show up in a robe and some Iron Sheik slippers? Oh, get out of here, Mike. <laughs> um, well, it was definitely a 10. I was thoroughly disappointed just for the fact that I spent all my allowance money pretty much like three three weeks worth to get wrestling shoes which were like a hundred bucks at the time and you know saving up for that and a sports physical to do wrestling and you know, it, it just broke my heart because i was i don't know if it was because i was expecting a ring there or the fact that i was that naive to think that there would be pro wrestling in high school <clears throat> you were far from the only kid that showed up for the wrestling team thinking there was going to be a ring there I've heard it oh, yeah. many well, times. Maybe maybe not on my team, but I'm I'm sure that's happened. Uh, I'd like to think I'm not the only one that's that that that's happened to. You, so, so the Olympics. I mean, it was it was a few years after the Olympics that that you really started training. I mean, what happened in the interim, and how did you end up finding a school to train you for professional wrestling? Uh, well, because the uh, I mean, just to go back on your previous question, you know, like. Uh, you know, I was really disappointed that it wasn't professional wrestling, but definitely after that first practice, I learned to fall. Like, I fell in love with amateur wrestling after that first practice because, like, there's no other sport like it. So I just definitely think um, 
like amateur wrestling helped pave my path just for the fact i mean taking to the olympics and all that and then the amateur wrestling took me to college and got me a degree and you know and then when i was there in college i i saw more signs that pro wrestling was was my was my path because i i didn't realize it until after i went there that uh like i went uh bobby lashley went to the same college that i did um and then harley races school was about an hour and a half from my college so i just i just saw signs all over the place where i was like you know after this college thing after i get my degree then this is this is a path that i'm going to go on so your first big break on on national television was lucha underground and you ended up being matanza and i remember when when it first came out that jeff cobb was playing matanza you know, a lot of people were, were skeptical, mainly because the Matanza character that we never saw was like 10 feet tall, and you're not quite 10 feet tall. But, I mean, the way that they did it, I mean, I thought it was very effective. And what I thought was, was interesting was the Matanza character, I mean, you basically had to play Frankenstein. Like, you got to do a couple of cool things, but you mostly were Frankenstein. And it was fascinating because... Even though you were playing Frankenstein and weren't showing like everything that you were able to do, all of a sudden it was like everybody wanted Jeff Cobb. And all of a sudden it seemed like you just started getting bookings everywhere. Is, is that what actually happened or is that just sort of my imagination? Um, I mean, you know, definitely Lucha Underground helped um, get my name out there. And it also helped me um, meet a bunch of people that I probably wouldn't have met until way down the road. Like um, meeting like like John Morrison and, and Ricochet or... Or if Ricochet was there, uh, there was a guy that looked just like him, uh, Prince Puma. Meeting him, and yes. Then meeting all, and then Conan and working with him, and then just getting these contacts and just having these people see what I could do, and then you know that I mean it definitely helped um, in the grand scheme of things. So I'm, I'm very fortunate for Lucha Underground. I mean, I mean at first I was, I still get to this day. It's been probably two or I don't even know when. It, I think it was like 2015 or 16 when. Lucha Underground started, but it's been about five or six years since then, and I still get people to this day that are like, oh, that was you? So, uh, definitely, uh, I, I like that aspect of it. Very quickly, I mean, what can you tell us about the rise and fall of Lucha Underground? Because that first season, I loved that first season. I thought it was so great. Second season was, was still very good, but kind of fell off after that, and then sort of fizzled into the death I mean, I guess maybe there's going to be another season someday, but it seems highly unlikely. I mean, what are your thoughts having having been there? I enjoyed it. Um, I definitely enjoyed my time there. Um, I kind of wish they would do they would have done more. It's just um, like the wrestling side kind of intertwined with like business and and the theater or not the theater, but like just the, the business side of it, like the, like the companies like El Ray network and whatnot, like, and then MGM. And it was just like, I, they started dabbling into our side of the, our, our side of the yard. And then it just made everything such a mess. Like if they would have just let the wrestling, the wrestling side, just, just leave us alone. Cause we were, I think like it, it was starting to get such a big buzz. Um, Cause I remember I remember one day in particular, I, I can't remember when it was, but it was like, I remember the Royal Rumble was on the same day we were doing a taping. And there's there's more people like tweeting about like Lucha Underground from like the, the day before's um, show. And then they're tweeting about it today or the day of. And I was like, man, we're getting just amount, just the same amount as uh, tweets as uh, the WWE's Royal Rumble. So I was like, you know, there was a good buzz going but unfortunately, like, um, unfortunately, they're like just they just they should have just left it like left our stuff alone and just let our because our ratings were really well on on the L Ray Network and they they should have just left us alone like let the wrestling do the wrestling you guys worry about this and then let's converge on it but um yeah I think it's just too much uh, too much uh, too many cooks in the kitchen yeah too many yeah too many cooks in the kitchen. Well, for the people that didn't see you there, they definitely saw you in PWG and in Ring of Honor. And I think the last time that a lot of people may have seen you uh, who aren't regular New Japan watchers, it was appearing for AEW, coming in for, for one time 
What is your contract status, if you feel like talking about it, in North America as it stands right now? And with New Japan running in California, is there anything you can do that you can't do? And is there anything that you want to do right now that you're uh, when all this stuff kind of settles down and uh, some of this COVID stuff goes away? Um, I mean, as far as contract status, um, I I was uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to sign a contract. Unfortunately, I don't say who it's with uh, because I wanted them to announce it first. But then this craziness happened um, around March, so that kind of delayed the uh, delayed the announcement. So I'm I'm not saying where I'm announced, but or where I'm signed, but I am signed somewhere, and they're. They've been very fortunate and and pleasing to work with because they're they're just letting me do whatever I want and I, it's really cool. Like and I, I, I'm having a blast doing it. I'm, I mean, obviously, I'm fortunate right now. Like very rare, very few places are doing shows. So, I mean, I'm just hoping this thing goes away soon so we can all get back to normal. So obviously the tournament coming up, New Japan Cup 2020 on the New Japan Strong Show. Eight-man tournament. We got Carl Fredericks versus Kenta, David Finley versus Chase Owens, Brody King versus Tama Tonga, and Jeff Cobb and Tonga Loa is the opening round match here. And any thoughts on that match? And is there any particular, is there anyone in this tournament that you've never had a singles match with? Uh, well, there's a, well, uh, Gorillas of Destiny. I, I, I wrestled them numerous times in uh, tag matches and multi-man matches over in Japan. Um, never a singles match with any one of them, but they, I mean, they're both amazing athletes and scary wrestlers. So, I mean, they're their dad's Haku, so they, they definitely got that toughness from him. Uh, I haven't had a singles match with, with Kenta, so that, like, if I can get out of the first round, that'd be great. Like, if Kenta gets out of his first round as well, because I mean can't look past Carl Fredericks, but like if that if the stars align and me and Kenza can wrestle in the second round, that'd be great. And um yeah, I mean I've never wrestled with David Finley either, but we're usually teaming more than we wrestle each other. Let's cut to the chase here. In your prime, who would have won? You or Haku? Uh oh. Oh jeez. Um I'm gonna put my money on Haku, man, because I've heard I've heard some stories. I've I'm too scared to ask you if they're true. But just looking at the man and and the toughness of him, I'm I'm gonna say that those stories are pretty true. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna go with Haku. I'll put my wow. Hand in. Now, wow. Jeff, I got I got to ask one question to to follow that one up. Just from what you've seen, would you ever wear filthy Tom Lawler's ring gear? Oh. <laughs> um. Well, if I get my summer bot on, I might switch to the those. <laughs> You never say maybe, never. Maybe, maybe maybe going tanning, maybe yes, but I don't know about. I don't know if I could wear that in a ring. Was this the first series of matches you've got to do since the? I know that there's some shows running here and there, but I mean, was was the the last series and in this series the first chance you've gotten to get back in there since this all happened? Oh yeah, the the, the tag match that I had with uh, myself and Rocky Romero against uh, TJP and Carl Frederick was my first match since. Oh gosh, like March third. Wow, three, three months. I mean, what was it like? Have that. you been training in the meantime? I mean, was there cardio issues? What was everybody thinking when they got back in there, having done nothing for so long? Uh, I mean, you you know, like I'm sure. Oh, well, the, the the real the real professionals are always training, so sure you can keep your body in that physical condition, but it's just like it's a there's a difference between you know. Sprinting on a track and wrestling weights. Well, yeah, hold that thought real quick. I'm sorry, we got to head to a break. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. Jeff Cobb joining us here today. He'll be facing Tongaloa in the opening round of the New Japan Cup 2020, part of New Japan Strong, which is going to be airing starting this Friday. NJPWWorld.com. New shows up at 10 Eastern every Friday. And Jeff, let's get some plugs in for this social media if you've got it, whatever you want. All right, cool. Uh, well, Twitter, uh, Real Jeff Cobb, because there's a lot of fake ones out there. Um, so yeah, Real Jeff Cobb, Twitter, the uh, Facebook fan page, Jeff Cobb, Instagram, Jeff Cobb. I keep it simple so I can remember them. <laughs> that is, uh, that's pretty simple. Yeah. 
it's real easy to remember. Uh, for OCT, just search Jeff Cobb. I think I'm right after Jeff, or right before Jeff Hardy and Jeff Jarrett. So, yeah, I'm there. Is and Jeff Farmer in there? The fake Sting? Does he have a pro wrestling tease store? Or we don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's, there'll be some tributes to Rick Bogger soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I want to thank you so much for doing the show here today. And of course, New Japan Cup 2020, part of NJPW Strong, every Friday night at njpwworld.com. And all of those Lions Break Collision shows, we talked about those today and yesterday. Those are also up at njpwworld.com, all sorts of other great stuff, so check that out. And, Jeff, good luck in the tournament. I want to thank you so much for doing the show today, and best of luck. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on. And, uh, yeah, keep on watching uh, New Japan. And we are out of time. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Lots of stuff up on the front page at WrestlingObserver.com. Thanks, Mike, as always. Callers and listeners, everybody to the studio. We'll talk to you again next time. Wrestling Observer Live.